So we're going to start by um, having Brady Robinson from the Access Fund give a few words and introduce him. And then hopefully in the meantime, we'll get both screens up and running. So thanks, Brady. Uh, I'm Brady Robinson. I'm the executive director of the Access Fund. We're the national organization that keeps climbing areas open and conserved in the United States. Uh, Tommy's a former board member. And I'm um, lucky enough to, to get to introduce him today. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, we've got staff all around the country. We've got someone in uh, Sonora, California. Anybody know where that is, presumably? Yeah, near Jailhouse, Goldwall. Anybody climb there? Um, is everybody here a climber? Most, more, more, pretty much? Okay, I just got to gauge the audience here. All right, all right, good. Um, yes, yeah, so we're based in Boulder. We've got staff all around the country. And the, the only way that we can have a national reach and be relevant nationally is with our affiliate organizations. We have over 100 affiliate organizations. One of, frankly, our most uh, well-organized and most effective is the Bay Area Climbers Coalition. Ellie, great job setting everything up here. Um, so we work in partnership with local groups. We're the national, they're the local. And a few of the things that we've been able to do here recently, um, we've, uh, so Castle Rock State Park for a long time had a bolting ban. Basically, you couldn't even replace bolts. We worked in partnership with Bay Area Climbers Coalition to try to reverse that so that when we are clipping things in the outdoors, they're hopefully safe and we can depend our lives on it. We finally got permission to do that. And this very next weekend, Ali, you all are doing a rebolting effort out there. They have enough volunteers for that. They could use a little more coin for the hardware, however. And so if you would like to make a donation to the local group, you can do that with uh, your badge and Google will match it. You can also support uh, the Access Fund is a national organization. We get the majority of our funding for our 24 staff through individual donations from people just like you. Uh, since 2011, uh, uh, Google employees and the company through gift matching have given us over $38,000. So if you're a part of that, I want to thank you personally for supporting climbing and this and utilizing this generous gift matching that Google offers up. Um, we've also, we're working on the gold wall. We got jailhouse open a while back. Anybody, any jailhouse aficionados here? Okay, not as many. Um, <laughs> that's cool. Um, something to aspire to, it's kind of hard. Um, we're working on the uh, Yosemite climbing management plan. Who's been to Yosemite here and climbed in Yosemite? El Cap? <laughs> All right, more things to aspire to. Um, we're also doing a stewardship, Access Fund is doing a stewardship training in Yosemite this very weekend. So we're taking uh, local climbing volunteers and land managers for four days and then teaching them like, what is this climbing thing? How do you manage it? How do you take, uh, how do you take care of these places? One of the issues that we're dealing with in our community right now is that climbing gyms are sprouting up all over the nation and more people are coming into the sport. And so on the one hand, that's great. We're becoming more of a political constituency. Climbers' voices actually matter. We just got back from Washington, D.C. Tommy and I were there advocating for public lands, bear's ears, the voice of the climbers. Honestly, unthinkable even maybe eight years ago like that, that climbers would be a political constituency. We are, from my perspective, that's good news. The flip side of that is there's more of us in the outdoors. And so increasingly, certainly with the Bay Area Climbers Coalition and the Access Fund, increasingly we're working on not just making sure that we have access to these places, but they're not getting trashed as a function of our use. So again, uh, we've, we're doing a lot in the area. I won't, um, I won't go more into that really, but thank you for your, your generosity in that. We are doing a, uh, we're doing our Stand Up for Public Lands event. There's, these little cards are available over there uh, in, the, in Oakland, September 9th. Um, he's not confirmed yet, but I think Jimmy Chin's gonna be the keynote. So if, you, if you're friends with him on social media, give him a little nudge. Um, <laughs> but uh, hopefully he's going to confirm. And so, yeah, so again, that's great. Um, oh, and our partnership with Google. So Sandy is uh, incredible. She was uh, the force behind the street view mapping of the nose and has done a really great job from my perspective of identifying other cool things to do in the climbing world. And um, we did a street view mapping of the homestead in Arizona. So if you're at your desk and you get a little time to kill, uh, try to find the street view of the homestead. We uh, have y'all seen the trekker that you guys have? There's like way 55 pounds. Um, we, we hiked through one of our climbing areas and mapped it out for you so you can check that out. We're also, uh, Google is supporting us in an inventory and a mapping project at Red Rocks outside of uh, Nevada. So one of the greatest climbing areas in the country. 
your company is supporting us in walking through there and doing an inventory so we can figure out where the trails are and which ones need to be worked on. So we have a great partnership with your company as well. And I'm personally just kind of a fan. So um, finally though, Tommy. So um, I won't, I'll keep this fairly short. Tommy is one of the greatest climbers of our generation, um, hands down. He's a great guy. He served on our board for six years when he had a lot of other things to do. Um, and I think the one thing I would just say before I turn it over to Tommy is it's really hard for us to fathom the amount of time and dedication it took for him to do the Dawn Wall with a completely uncertain outcome. So my little tiny insight into that. So I was fortunate enough to climb the nose of El Capitan in 2012. And uh, I climbed it with two other guys. We, we, we climbed it in a day. We got to the top. We were exhausted. We were beat down. We were walking down the east ledge's descent, rappelling down kind of in a stupor. And there's a headlamp at the bottom of the ropes. It's like 1030 at night, maybe 11. I can't remember what time it was. And it looked like somebody was going the wrong direction, coming up the ropes we were going down. Who the heck would be by themselves humping a huge load in the middle of the night? Tommy Colmo. That is the sort of dedication it took to not only find that there was a possible route on that part of El Cap, but then ultimately rehearse the moves over many years and finally send the thing. It's incredible the amount of dedication and this, the, the number of hours he put in where nobody was looking, no, there were no cameras and it was just what he did. So Tommy, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Come on up and talk to Got this one in. Hello. Um, awesome. This is actually um, my second time coming to Google to uh, present a show. Uh, we came to present uh, the Street View one other time, and it was pretty surprising to me when I came before. It was like this room full of climbers. I thought I'd come and speak to a bunch of tech nerds or something, and it turns out <laughs> it's climber nerds and stuff. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it felt like it was in a, a room of friends. Um, it's been pretty extraordinary to me to see climbing go where it's gone. I mean, I felt a, like I spent the majority of my life in this close-knit community where it was just a bunch of climbers. And I knew basically everybody. But in the last few years or 10 years or so, it's expanded. And climbing is having this reach that it never has before. I mean, just the fact that there's this many climbers at Google. And you know, I'm coming to Google to speak these days and going to Capitol Hill and lobbying, um, we have a voice. And really, Google's been a big part of that. And so I just want to thank you guys. Thanks, Sandy. Um, yeah, helping, helping to spread the great word, because I feel like climbing has the power to transform lives. And it's such a great act activity. So my presentation today, I was, um, I'm in the midst of a book tour, crazy book tour, 25 stops or something in three weeks. And Sandy managed, like she always does, to convince us to squeeze one more in here today. Uh, <laughs> which is really fun. Um, yeah, so I, this book is, um, it's pretty deep. Um, I think that when people start reading it, they'll, you know, that's been the major input. Like, I was really vulnerable. And I got to admit, when I, when, you know, I, I sat down and I knew I wanted to write something, that I would try to transcend the, you know, the kind of the typical climbing book or even sports memoir world, and I knew I had to go, go really deep. I tried to think as little about what other people would think of that. I just knew I needed to make it as close to my heart as possible. And then on publication day last week, I was walking to my first event, feeling slightly unnerved, a little vulnerable. I was like, I'm about to expose the depths of my soul to the entire world. And I was walking down the street in New York City on my way to my first event. And uh, hold on one second. And uh, I came across this sign right here. <laughs> across the street, high four and a half, New York City giving me a little nudge. Everything is going to be just fine. Um, you know, as this book is revealed to the world, I've had quite a few people in the literary world come up to me and be like, a memoir at age 38, like, aren't you supposed to be at least 70 or something to write something like that? And the truth is maybe, maybe you should wait that long. But there's a reason that I decided to write this book now. And it really comes down to this moment that Brady mentioned on the Don Wall. This is January 14th, 2015. And this was a crazy day in my life for a lot of reasons. First of all, it was something that I had worked for 
you know, really for seven years specifically on this route, but in a way I felt like it was the culmination of like my entire life. I started climbing when I was three and this kind of took all the skills that I had accumulated to come to this one moment that I really wasn't sure was ever gonna happen. I worked on this thing for a lot of years and I totally gave up on several occasions and something would always bring me back and um, it was just this incredible journey and this moment here was the realization of that, um, so it was really emotional. The other reason it was crazy, though, is because, um, like I said, I felt like I've always lived in this little close-knit climbing community, and I've been a professional climber, so climbers have followed along in this way, but topping out on this day um, was, you know, something happened in the media. About three years before this, my climbing partner, Kevin Jorgensen, had started using social media to tell people about what we were doing up on the wall. Started posting updates on this climb to Twitter. And at first, I was kind of a curmudgeon. I was like, no, oh, climbing is soulful. It's just about me and your buddy in the mountains, and we shouldn't really let anybody into this world. But we came down from this um, first climb, or this, this year that he was posting Twitter updates, and every day people would come up to me and be like, man, what are you going back? That was the most inspiring thing ever. You know, the highlight of my day at work was um, watching, you know, going on Twitter and figuring out what you, what you guys were doing. And so I started to change my view on it a little bit. I started to feel like if I, we weren't sharing, it was almost like being selfish. We were keeping this experience to ourselves. So I followed suit. I started going on Facebook and Instagram and doing the same thing in the subsequent years. And for a while, the climbing community followed along then most people gave up on us because they're like, they're never going to do that thing. <laughs> Nobody had actually worked on a route for that many years in a row. But then in 2014, or the end of 2014, the beginning of 2015, as it seemed like it might actually happen, the climbers got super stoked. And then that energy started to bleed outside of the climbing world. Um, a gentleman by the name of John Branch from the New York Times wrote an article for the New York Times. Um, it got picked for the cover of the newspaper, and there was a lot of interest. And then it just kind of spread from there. The, the Times decided to run articles on the cover for like five consecutive days. And there was something like 13 billion media, media impressions. And so we were up there on the wall in our little community of climbers, and we had a filmmaker up there. And we were looking down at El Cap Meadow and seeing all these trucks show up. And, it was kind of nuts, so I hucked my phone off the wall. I was like, we got to stay in the, in the midst of this climbing experience. But when we topped out on this day, you couldn't ignore it anymore. I'd climbed El Cap 65 times by this point, and nobody had ever greeted me on top. And this was the middle of January, and like 80 people showed up on the top of El Cap with cameras. The president called, President Obama called to congratulate us. <laughs> there was this really crazy phenomenon over the next days where I would be walking down the streets in Yosemite or I went to New York pretty quickly after this and like old ladies would come up to me with tears in their eyes and they're like that was the most inspiring thing ever and I was thinking to myself like old ladies are just not the demographic I thought would be <laughs> inspired by this kind of thing this is so strange but one thing this did is it um, kind of clued me into the power of storytelling I think people think that social media is this quick hit format, but I actually think when it's done most effectively, it's a pretty long, uh, long format way to still tor tell stories. You can actually follow somebody's life indefinitely. And these news stories were cool in some ways, and the, the sort of the most reputable news sources did, did the story justice, I felt like, like the New York Times and NPR, but the vast majority just took climbing and they sensationalized, sensationalized it. They had all the facts wrong. They said we were climbing without ropes. And, um, and it, like, a little bit of my heart broke. You know? I was like, oh, this, uh, this sport that I am so endeared to and is actually being spread to the world, it's great it's being spread to the world, but it's like they're not getting it quite right. And so I f started to feel like I needed to um, write a book. And so. Yeah, I, it was funny. I, I came down from the dawn while I had all these emails in my inbox, and I had kind of decided that I wanted to write a book. Um, and so I started going through the emails, and there was a few literary agents and publishing companies, and so I emailed them back. And I decided to go to New York City, and on the plane I was like, oh, I'm going to meet with literary agents, but I have really no idea what I'm going to say or how to write a book. So I just quickly started typing, and I like typed my whole life story out on the airplane on the way to New York City. And then I emailed it off that night to the people I was meeting the next morning. And then I met, went and met with everybody, and most, most of them were like, yeah, you should probably get a ghostwriter. <laughs> <laughs> most, most athletes don't actually write their own memoirs. But 
there was this one guy, um, David Larabelle, who believed in my story for whatever reason. And he said, I think you can write. I think you have potential here. And he sort of started advising me. And so that's the guy I picked as my literary agent. He said, you should write a 50-page book proposal and show them what you can actually do. And so I spent two months working on this book proposal. Um, and you know, it, it was kind of, it was this thing where I didn't really know how to write a book, but I know how to climb mountains, so I just started to approach it like I do climbing mountains. First, I did some research, and I'm really lucky to live in this community of good authors. Um, I called up John Krakauer, who you guys have probably heard of him. He's a bit of a friend of mine, and got some information from him, and Jim Collins, and they, they expressed a lot of confidence in me, which was huge. Um, and they also just kind of gave me some business advice. But then really, the most important thing when you're writing a book, or when you're climbing a mountain, actually, is to get a good partner. So uh, I called my next door neighbor, this guy right here, Kelly Cordes. And I decided that, you know, he would, you know, we decided together that we were going to kind of embark on this journey together. And the working process was, I would sit down and write the chapters and try and make them as good as I could. And then he would, take his more literary mind and help me elevate them. And so, you know, I, I think the whole ghostwriting thing didn't really appeal to me because uh, as a climber, I was like, well, you don't hire somebody to climb a mountain for you, <laughs> but you do find a good partner. And so uh, I think it worked pretty well. I hope people will like the book. It's kind of a testament that if you get the right people on the bus with you and you work really hard, um, you can venture into realms that you have no idea <laughs> what, it, what it's like. And you know, climbers do this all the time. Um, so I sat down and I started writing. And you would think after the Dawn Wall, I would have written um, about the Dawn Wall. But I felt moved to write about a very different moment in my life. It was 15 years earlier. Um, and it was this moment that was so intense that I had never really let myself go back there. I think climbers um, tend to focus very intensely on the things that will help them get their jobs done, or really people that really are, you know, excel in any world do this, I suppose. Um, and for me, writing was very different that, than that. Instead of focusing intensely, I felt like I had to like take those binoculars off and see everything. And so I went back to this moment when I was 21 years old, this first excerpt I'm going to read is my first big international climbing expedition to the, to the mountains of Kyrgyzstan in um, Central Asia. And this, the, the other characters in this excerpt are uh, Jason Singer and John Dickey. They were the male members of the expedition. Beth Rodden was my girlfriend at the time. And then she, um, Sue and, and Abdul are members of the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. Um, we, as you know, relatively naive, young American climbers had gone into this mountain region figuring that the mountains are a safe place. And in this part of the world, that wasn't the case in 2001. There was a kind of an opium trade trail that appeared through the mountains. And the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan moved over these really high mountain passes when the snow melted on, from one side of us. And then the Kyrgyz military came from the other side. And we were at that point of collision. We got taken hostage for six days um, in a war. We, we had to abandon everything that we had with our captors. No warm clothes, no food. Um, you know, on the verge of hypothermia for six days, where we just got closer and closer to death, frankly. And um, by the end, um, it was getting pretty real. So this excerpt is this moment that I felt moved to write about. So this was, these were the very first words I wrote in this book. Starvation is a funny thing. You feel it first in your stomach, a nauseating pain low in your gut. Your breathing becomes labored, and your body slows. Your mind goes next. Indifference takes over. Emotions dull. But after several days, the pain in my stomach went away. I still don't know how it happened or where it came from. But as everyone else grew weaker, I felt stronger. I noticed my night vision improving. Lines became crisp. By the time the sun, sun had set on the sixth day, I was aware of every sound, every movement. Um, I felt a lightness, a vitality, as though I could race straight, straight uphill without my heart rate rising. I saw myself again as a warrior. On our sixth night, our captors hatched a plan. They, too, were starving and cold. So Abdul would return to our base camp to scavenge any remaining food and warmer clothes. 
The rest of us would ascend a 2,000 foot mountainside, a mixture of callous fields and nearly vertical cliff bands. To us, at least in our normal states, it was easy terrain. Abdul, after gather, gathering more rations, would come up another side, a less treacherous way, and meet us on top. For the first time, we were alone with Sue. The moon plays tricks in the darkness, casting shadows that dance across the cliffs. A jumbled mess of stone disappears below, blackness. Far in the distance, stars illuminate the jagged spires and snow-covered mountains. Sue's feet skid as he lets out a pain grunt. I watch as Singer guides him, pointing out footholds and a handhold solid enough to grab. The plan had been for Beth and me to stay above, out of the fall line. We climb higher. Sue wobbles again, and I hear the clatter of rocks tumbling down the nearly sheer drop-off. Now, now. Silently, I'm urging them to do it, willing them to do it. Singer and Dickie resume their guiding. More spots, spots pass where Sue is exposed and insecure. I try not to think about what it is that, I wish, that I'm wishing that they would do. As the top nears, Sue gains confidence and scrambles ahead of them, using his hands to keep his balance as he clambers over loose rock. At a more difficult section, just 50 feet from the top, but 20 feet to her right, he slows. Singer and Dickie are still below. I glance down. Our eyes meet. They nod. I look at Beth. I'm going to have to do this, I whisper. It has to be me. She trembles. Shadows cross her face. Her lips o open slightly, but no sounds escape. For a moment, we stare at one another. She dips her head. I know. The strength has been growing into a monster inside of me, emerging from nowhere, from everywhere, unlike anything I've known. I accelerate across a series of footholds with the swiftness of a mountain goat, staying silent through the shadows. Fifteen, ten, five feet away and still, Sue doesn't see me coming. The barrel of his rifle glistens under the stars. I see the outline of the grotesque mole on his upper lip. My foot dislodges a loose chunk of rock. He turns sharply towards me. Our eyes lock. I lunge for the strap of the gun slung over his shoulder. I pull as hard as I can and push his shoulder. His body arcs backwards through the blackness outlined by the moon. He cries out in surprise and fear. His body lands on a ledge with a sickening thud and then bounces towards oblivion. For a moment, I hear and feel nothing. Then vertigo strikes me. I think the sun is rising. Glimmers of light blur into long, indistinct streaks, somehow real and surreal at the same time. Suddenly, as if a stone has crashed down on my head, every muscle in my body contracts and I squeeze my eyes shut as hard as I can. I scramble and sprint the remaining distance to the top of the mountain where I stand alone, panting. I drop to the ground and tuck myself into as tight of a ball as possible. I rock back and forth, sobbing. Everything I've held inside floods out of me. I had just killed a man, not an evil villain, but a man not so different from myself. Scared, juvenile, a man who probably had a family at home waiting for his return. I shouted at God to wake me from this nightmare. It was too horrible to, to be real. I shook uncontrollably and wondered if I was going mad. So, yeah, writing those first words in this book was like this incredibly cathartic experience. Not only was it kind of traumatizing in a way because I could suddenly like feel that fear again and smell the smells, but it also started to help me knit together these kind of crazy experiences I had. And when I thought about writing a book, I kind of thought I was going to write a typical adventure story, um, something relatively uplifting. <laughs> and then I wrote these seeds and I was like, whoa, this is heavy, like the heaviness of my life kind of struck me. And so I think this book, you know, has a, has a lot of heaviness in it. Um, and so, you know, I felt like after writing that, like I needed to, f to finish this book before I knew I wanted to write a book afterwards. I just knew that there was no option to, but, but to actually continue writing this thing and see it through. And I became very, very obsessed by it by the, in the same way that I do climbing. Um, so Kelly and I really, we sat down and we started to kind of dissect my life a little bit. We wanted to bring out um, sort of the essence of what climbing is, um, my, of what my story is, which in a lot of ways it's ed of overcoming adversity, is taking these hard experiences in life and figure out, figuring out how to have them energize you and you know, turn them into something good. 
And as I started back at the beginning in my childhood, um, I, I realized that everything was so intertwined. You know, I, when I wrote that Kyrgyzstan section, I think I did it then because I felt like it was somehow related to the Dawn Wall. But when I started at the beginning, I was like, it's all intertwined. And so I started to think about things like, um, you know, a big emerging thing was this father-son relationship. Um, you know, what does it mean to have this father that is so full of life that he's able to make his body look like this. Um, <laughs> kind of a crazy dude. And then what's the psychological effect of, of, as if a kid, if all you want to do is to make yourself look like him. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, you know, I really love the, the part of this book that really deals with that relationship. I think I realized how powerful that is, and especially as a dad these days. I wanted to kind of analyze how my dad had raised me to see how I would do things differently. And then another big theme is the, um, the power of nature. I mean, my dad had me out in the mountains from a really young age. He loves to tell this story about um, taking me into a raging blizzard when I was three years old and digging a snow cave and having a sleep in the snow cave where he said he actually changed my diapers in a snow cave in a blizzard when I was three years old. <laughs> and we did things like this all the time. Like, I, you know, there was, I have countless memories of like running from lightning storms. By the time I was six, I knew like when lightning is close by, you need to like crouch in a certain position so that the electricity won't travel through you if you get struck by lightning. And you know, I learned to really love this environment, but I also possibly um, like the like what risk is might have got a little bit tweaked in my head. Like <laughs> I became I became almost addicted to these experiences in this weird way. And so a lot of this, this book deals with risk. Um, this is an interesting quote that I came across when I was writing this book. This is from a, from a friend of mine, actually, uh, Tom Hornbein, who wrote a really, really beautiful book called The West Ridge of Everest. Um, he, did, he was on the team that did the first ascent of that route on Everest um, way back when you had to hike 200 miles even just to get to the base of the mountain. Um, but th he's a doctor, and so the quote is, uh, maybe we can view risk like we would a drug beneficial to the organism in its proper dose, too much or too little may be, may be harmful. Um, so the middle part of this book is really just story after story of me going out in the mountains and pushing myself, sometimes to, to you know, pretty extreme places. <laughs> and you know, I wondered why I did this. Um, here's another passage from the middle that I'm going to read you. This is my first trip to Patagonia in southern Argentina. The days passed and we couldn't push any higher. Nearly 2,000 feet up the wall, we, we came upon a small perch, uh, perch atop a detached flake, some 16 inches off the rock face and three feet wide. The snow and ice caked itself in the narrow gap. This would have to be our bivy. We packed more snow to level the surface. Backs to the wall and sitting upright, feet and legs stuffed into a light person, two person, or lightweight two-person bivy sack with no sleeping bag, we tried to rest. I ran slings around my upper body to lash myself from, to the rock. I clipped my helmet strap to the lines to support my head. I was like an insect caught in a spider's web. Dust filled spectral red, yellow, blue, indigo, and violet all stacked and blended together across the western sky. The wind had exhausted itself and lain down. All was still, all was surreal and utterly beautiful. Only when I closed my eyes and the natural wonders went dark did a lance of cold and fear pierce me. Teeth chattering, flesh stinging cold had me rattling against my web of slings like a shivering puppet. Why the hell would anybody put himself through this? I beat my heels up and down trying to stir blood flow into my wooden feet. The cold had seeped into my brain and I kept thinking that I was going to lose my toes and fingers. I thought of Beth and lying nestled against her body radiating heat. I had visions of the black and withered toes of friends of frostbite victims that I'd seen. Finally, first light crept in. As high as we were on the highest mountain in the range, we stared at the sliver of sun, awaiting its warmth, grateful that we are now in some kind of purgatory, not quite heaven, but no longer frozen hell. I began untangling myself from the web of slings. We rose and continued climbing, but our pace slowed. Seeps of meltwater left over from the last storm had frozen, leaving the face coated in a treacherous veneer of air glass. Clouds built overhead. We could hear the wind coming from the west like an enraged beast. 
Though Topher and I were protected on the east face, I could see massive chunks of ice flying from the summit and landing a mile away on the glacier. I was strangely at peace as the mountain came alive and the sky turned dark. We were some 2,500 feet above the glacier when we, be when we began a hasty retreat. The storm blasted in with alarming suddenness, growing as we descended, leaving us soaked and shivering. We stumbled down the glacier, protected by Fitzroy's hulking mass. When we emerged from the sheltered side, the wind threw me to the ground. I knelt on the glacier anchored by my ice tool, and I tucked my head to avoid the flying shards of ice. Soon after, I lost hold of my helmet and watched it blow into the sky over the horizon. Despite the storm's flurry, soon the wind calmed and the skies cleared. Different sounds then emerged. The rumble of collapsing Syrac, the crunch of crampons in the snow, the rhythm of our breasts. Rocky summits gl glowed, glowed crystal clear. There was beauty as peaceful as anything I had known. So a lot of this was really trying to digest these experiences and you know, trying to figure out why I feel almost moved or the need to push myself to these extremes. And you know, I wrote this at a time in my life which was actually really good because I was trying to figure out not only how to be a good um, husband to my wife, but also be a good dad to my kids. <laughs> Everybody loves that photo. Um, the last excerpt I'm gonna read here is a letter that I wrote to my son Fitz after another trip to Patagonia. Um, this was my fourth trip to the same mountain range and this is you know, kind of where my thoughts went after I was a new dad and I actually went on this trip. This was the first time I went to a big mountain region and brought my family with me. They were staying in town at the base of the mountains for the majority of this trip while I would go into the mountains and climb. So um, this is the letter. It's hard to believe that just one week ago, I said goodbye to you and your mom as you boarded the bus to start your travels home, and I hiked into the mountains. So much has ha happened since then, and I'm struggling to wrap my head around it. I've had a huge adventure for sure. I wonder if you would have recognized Alex and me staggering back into El Chal Ten with ripped clothes and the fuzzy remains of our rope draped over my shoulder. Alex had to walk close behind me because he was snow blind. We looked and smelled awful. When we got to town, we heard the news that Chad Kellogg was dead, killed by rockfall two days earlier. Do you remember him smiling, smiling at you from the end of the table at La Senora? He was a new friend, as experienced a climber as any of us. The news made me nauseous and took my breath away. I choose to climb where the risks are manageable and tell myself that experience will keep me safe, but this could have happened to anyone on the mountain. I think of you and your mom. She knew who she was marrying, but you had no choice in the matter. I contemplate the last five days, the more than 12,000 vertical feet of climbing and 100 or so repels we just did. Was it real? I feel inspired in a way that only love and a grand journey can bring about. While you and your mom were cozy back in Colorado, I was in the middle of a struggle. My partner Alex and I had dreamed like so many others of traversing the entire Fitzroy range. It was an obvious goal, but I didn't really believe we would succeed. No one had yet. It was just too big. And yet, here we were, a third of the way through the traverse and high on Sarah Fitzroy, the mountain you're named after. I omitted the middle of the letter, but um, sitting safely now in central Alpino, I ink in my journal with more ramblings of life, love, the pursuit of a dream, pondering the merit of mountain climbing now that I am a father. Risk is selfish. The biggest tragedy I can imagine is not being there to see you take your first steps. <laughs> fall in love for the first time, or come to realize that you're blessed with the most beautiful, joyful, and graceful mom in the world. But for me, climbing makes everything else fit into place. It's what lights the fire, makes me a dreamer. The need to battle is built into the fabric of who we are. As humans, we, we may fight with the ones we love, poison our bodies with drugs, go to war. For many, the, the struggle is a desperate attempt to fill a void, but I find my battle on the mountain despite the risk and fear that resides there. It breathes life into me. If I can show you one thing, I hope it will be to choose your own struggle, stro chosen struggle, wherever you may find it, with vigor, optimism, and love. I love you, Daddy. So, um, yeah, the middle of this book gets a bit heavy, but there is a happy ending, I will say. 
And it really comes down to me figuring out that the answer is really finding this balance, um, finding the climbs and the experiences in life that fulfill me, that bring me into the mountains, um, that challenge me, but that I'm relatively certain I'll live through. Um, and so that was the Donwall. That's one of the reasons I got so obsessed by this thing. I could bring my family to Yosemite. I would go up on the wall, and I never feared death, but I was totally um, litten up by the journey. Instead of going into the Donwall thing, I'm going to show you guys a little trailer. This is I hesitated a little bit in showing this to you today because um, it's a bit complicated, but the, the filmmaker Josh Lowell, he was along with us on the journey for seven years, and he's been working very hard to make this film. Uh, he didn't have the time to make a trailer for me to show at these events, so they had sold the distribution rights of this film to Red Bull Media House, and so Red Bull Media House put together this trailer. It's a little bit cheesy. <laughs> um, if, if you like Disney movies, you'll probably love it. Um, but yeah, so anyways, this is, a, this is actually kind of a preview in a way to a film that'll probably be out this fall. Maybe this fall, we'll see when it comes out. Um, but just remember, put your cheese goggles on and yeah, enjoy. Hello? Hey guys, this is John Branch with the New York Times. How's it going up there? On the air tonight with a story of two men attempting to free climb the famously steep face of El Capitan in Yosemite. Tommy Caldwell and Kevin Jorgensen attempt the hardest free climb in the world. Using only their fingertips to grasp razor sharp edges. It's been six years in the making. 3,000 feet of straight up granite. I mean, it just looked impossible. It's just a monumental project. <laughs> There's a lot in Tommy's past that prepared him for this incredible challenge. For Tommy Caldwell, this is not his most miraculous story of survival. He was taken hostage. We wake up into gunshots. Tommy was using his parents' old table saw. He did something that he should never do. When I heard he cut his finger off, you know, so much for Tommy Caldwell. He cuts off his finger, and then he comes back way better. He overcame all of these challenges, and it just made him even more determined. Seeing footage of Tommy trying to free climb the Don Wall, trying to do these crazy moves. I just sent him a Facebook message, hey, do you need a partner? And here we go. Might be the last time we walk for a couple weeks, dude. Yeah. That way is made up of thousands of little micro sequences that have to be done perfectly. Everything was going smoothly until Jorgensen couldn't grasp pitch 15. Jorgensen was stopped by the sheer difficulty of the climb. Going to the top without Kevin was going to be devastating. What are you thinking? Everything I can to help him. We were in this thing together. I just had to give it one more try. I decided in that moment that we were gonna get to the top together. <laughs> this is the best climbing story of our generation. You have these moments where you have an opportunity to be a part of this piece of history. That's what I got for you guys today. Um, is there any questions? Um, in the film with you and Alex uh, climbing the Fitzroy, you mentioned that you had taken risks that you felt were inappropriate uh, because you had just become a father. Would you, you still b believe that? Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, it's for me, I think, that, for me, I think the way that I was raised, like I said, it maybe altered risk in my mind just a little bit. And so when I'm up on the mountain and scary things happen, um, usually my, my go-to, like my reaction at the time is to be like, ah, it's 
probably not gonna happen again. Like a giant rock falls off the mountain and lands 20 feet from us and poof, makes this big boom. And I'm like, well, that's probably not gonna happen again. And I, you know, I understand in a, in a way that that's not totally right. Like that's not normal. And so I have to be cautious from afar. Alex Honhold is like my drug dealer in a way, is my pusher, he's like, it's gonna, it's gonna be so good, you know, if we go up there and simul climb. And so, uh, it's true, it is like addicting, and I get pulled into that world occasionally, but hopefully I'll find that balance. That's really part of what writing this book is, because I hope it'll hit home, you know? <laughs> cool. Yep, right there. You worked for years on Donwall, and you finally succeeded. Congrats on that, of course. Thank um, you. But then, uh, on that repeated relatively soon afterwards. You know, what was your take on that? Yeah. So, um, yeah. For those who don't know, there's this there's this Czech phenom climber Adam Andra, who came, I guess, about a year or two years after I finished the Donwall, and basically did in a month what it took me seven years to do. <laughs> Which was, uh, honestly, I wish it would have taken him like a year, maybe. <laughs> but uh, it was hugely inspiring. And I think, you know, he trains like an Olympian, you know. He's like, he's got so much fire and he's very scientific. And, um, and it's like a testament to where this world can go. I think in terms of difficulty of rock climbing, there's a vast world. We only understand this much about it. And I'm going to be the hugest fan of what happens in the future forever. I'm definitely going to be one of those old men in the coffee shop just talking about the <laughs> climbing constantly because it's so fun to see that stuff go down. So, yeah. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, I'll be hanging out for a little bit, but uh, thank you, Sandy and Brady. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm good. I'm done. Thank you. Well, what I just wanted to say, like, one, thank you for coming. Thank you to Brady. Um, they're both very nice, but it's a massive team of people that's been helping both Tommy, Alex, Sender, um, and the Access Fund. And it's just, I mean, that's the amazing part about Google is that if you have an idea, you can really push it. So if you guys are excited about something, if you want to do something with them, if you have ideas, please come talk to me. Um, definitely reach out to Brady. Uh, so yeah, and huge thanks. Also, Wayne is in the back. His and whole team were really instrumental in the street view um, and getting earth imagery of Yosemite that made the project possible. So thank you. Oh, yeah, and I'll, I, maybe I'll just add to that. It's funny, when I was up on the Dawn Wall and this whole media thing was going down, the Street View team was kind of like assembling, and it just happened to be the same film makers that I was up there with. And so on our rest days, we were like bringing GoPros up there and building these bundles and tanking everything out and testing them up on the wall. And you know, this world of you know trying to figure out ways to tell these stories and bring them to the world has become a really fun thing. And um, yeah, Google's been part of that. And so I came down from the Don Wall. I went on the Ellen DeGeneres show. I went to LA for a few days, and I came right back to Yosemite and went back up on El Cap to film that street view thing that Sandy showed in the beginning. So yeah, like she said, if there's, if there's any way to integrate climbing into this Google world, it's fun for climbers to do that. So. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you.